see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here today with Keiko Kronke. And thank you very much, Keiko, for joining me to talk about how to build a culture of empathy. Thank you for inviting me. So first I want to start with getting a little bit of a background um, about you. And okay. you're um, Associate Professor at Manage of Management Business Communications at the University of Northern California. I mean, Northern, uh, Northern Col Colorado. Colorado. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, at the Moffitt, oh, Monfort College of Business. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And um, you you have a real interest in empathy. You're also working on a book on called Organizing Through Empathy. Through empathy. Yes, mm -hmm. and we're still working um, with that book right now. We have solicited some chapters, and we have gotten some abstracts, and we're going through them right now. So, so we are hoping that we can get that published next year. But we're uh, still waiting for a couple more reviews. Oh, great. Um, and you're also, I see that he says you're currently interested in learning about human consciousness and teaching empathy and compassion. So this is a real interest of yours. Yes, yes. Um, I teach in the business college, but I do not consider myself as a, a hardcore business person. And I really think that from my background, I used to teach languages. I have taught English as a second language and I have taught Japanese and, and I was in a PhD program in counseling as well. So I think that I could bring a lot of the human aspects into business. And, um, and I really am interested in human consciousness and empathy. And I believe that empathy is at the core. And I teach uh, business ethics. Mm. And, um, you know, we can talk about many theories, but at, at the heart of ethics, I think it's empathy. If we can all uh, behave and think and to be, a to be able to see how other people think and feel, um, a lot of that ethical issues can be resolved. Well, before we, we get into that, perhaps we can, I'm just on your uh, Facebook page here. I'm actually showing it. <laughs> And I see you with the horse, and you've got three uh, beautiful-looking dogs there. So can you tell yes. me a little bit about that? Um, they are greyhounds, and I uh, rescue greyhounds. And I, I do not have enough time to actually go, go out there and actually do the rescuing much anymore. But um, I consider myself to be an animal advocate, and I like to be the voice for the voiceless. And I care about, especially about children, uh, children's well-being and health and also animals because they they have no voice and I care about adults too but I care <laughs> much more about children and animals okay great and um, so yeah so let's uh, kind of get into it um, what can we do to build a culture of empathy um, you know how did you uh, get interested in in the uh, value of empathy and how did it become important to you um, I did not actually become interested. I actually was born uh, <laughs> differently. <laughs> as long as I remember, uh, I, it's almost like I, I was never a child. I remember when I was five years old, worrying about all the, uh, the suffering in the world. And my mother used to tell me I was always concerned about people being killed and animals being killed and, and people who are homeless at train stations. And, and my parents wondered what was wrong with me. You know, as a five-year-old, I was so concerned about um, suffering in general. And it, in a way, I'm cursed because I, I can always feel and hear the suffering of people and animals. And, and it's almost like... Um, I can never have a good day when other people are not having a good day, when other animals are not having a good day. So how can I have a good day when others are not having a good day? So, so I was like this. I, I was born like this, and I was never able to eat meat because as a five-year-old, I knew that someone suffered to be put on my plate. 
and I refused to be part of that suffering. So, so it's not that I became interested in empathy. Well, maybe academically, just in recent years, I, I thought that maybe I could just study more and see what other people have written about it, and I can learn more about it. But I was born with it. In, in some ways, I was cursed by it because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have always been very sensitive. And there isn't one picture of me as a child smiling. Hmm. So it's not a you know happy story, but uh -huh. but yeah, I guess so I you were you were like really. It sounds like you were really sensitive just to seeing people around you that were in pain. You would feel their pain and their suffering, right? And that you kind of wanted to do something about that, and you couldn't feel happy unless that was resolved. Or and I was an activist even as a child too. Um, here's one story I wanted to tell you. Um, I was born in Japan and I grew up there and I was there until I was about 27 and I was pro probably about only seven or eight years old but a dog catcher would come and catch all the stray dogs and I could hear the dogs yelping and crying and and he would put all the dogs in the back of a truck and and I would go and unlatch the <laughs> back of the truck and let all the stray dogs out and and I don't know which fate would have been better for the dogs, but there wasn't such a thing called the Humane Society. All the dogs were to be killed. So, so I was an activist, even when I was seven years old or eight years old. Well, you're talking about that you had empathy for the suffering of the animals and, and people. And there's, it's like empathy, it seems to me, it, it's a broader, it's also in the joy. Did you feel people's joy more intensely? Um, not really. Hmm. So, and I don't know how, if empathy can exist if there's no suffering. Actually, Jeremy Rifkin says there's no empathy. You know, if there's a place called heaven, there's no empathy because there's no suffering. So, I wonder if empathy is more, more strongly related to suffering than with joy. Hmm. But, so that's like a I, question you have, kind of like an unresolved question about the kind of how that empathy kind of works in relation to other feelings. Right, yes. And I, I can feel other people's joy, but, um, but I, I, I guess I feel more, more of the suffering from other people. And, and that's, that's partly the reason why, because I'm so sensitive about suffering, the reason why I studied appreciative inquiry and strength-based management. I don't know if you have heard about... I've heard uh, of appreciative in inquiry, but not the other management. It, it's or, more about, instead of looking at problems and sol trying to solve problems, uh, you look at the strengths and figure out how to leverage strengths rather than you know the problem solving or deficit uh, mode thinking you look at the strengths and how you, how you can do figure out how you can do more of that because um, what we think what we study tends to grow what we appreciate appreciates so more you pay attention to certain things whatever you pay attention to tends to get bigger so then I started thinking okay if I'm paying so much attention to suffering Am I making suffering bigger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is a very personal quest then. It, it uh -huh. is. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes uh, kind of engaging in this quest, I like to, you know, we we're talking a little bit about the definition of, of empathy and how it relates to pain and, or joy or suffering. I find that kind of having a starting with a metaphor is uh -huh, a nice yes. way to kind of frame uh, the experience and you know empathy is often defined as the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's right. eyes and for right. me empathy is like a cornucopia because it's this richness of of experience and yes. I was wondering if you have your own you know creative uh, metaphor of what empathy is like to you okay um, I would say empathy is wholeness and um, that's because especially in the Western world, we are living with so much duality. We're being asked to decide whether this is good or bad, or whether we agree or disagree, whether you're on this side or the other side, or, you know, I, I wonder if you remember President Bush saying, you are either with us or against us kind of thing, you know, either or. Um, by living that way, we are actually cutting half of ourselves off. 
and and personally, I try to uh, strive to live my life without judgment and to see other people as an extension of who I am as much as possible. And um, um, what's his name? Said that it's a leaky margin self. So it's almost like the margin of myself is leaking to other people so that the boundaries between me and you can become blurry. Mm. And so the understanding that having empathy is that maybe the boundary is so fuzzy that I see you as an extension of me and we are all one, part of the one field. So we all come from the same place. We're all made of the same, same place. And we can learn lessons from uh, new sciences like quantum physics that um, the universe is not made from separate particles, but it really is an interconnected wave of energy kind of thing. So, so there are many hints out there to tell us that we are not that separate, as separate as we might think. Okay, so for you, the uh, metaphor of, of empathy is like the sense of wholeness, a whole, like connected or, or seeing ourselves as part of a whole. Right. Of all of, of right. life and existence, maybe. Right. And it's part of our evolution, too, that it is an illusion that there is my way and this is a separate me. And in the end, um, what you do and what I do may be all part of the same thing. So uh, until we realize that, um, you know, sort of get rid of that unhealthy ego, um, there is no kind of spiritual growth. So to me, having empathy is um, being um, that kind of person, that kind of existence. And that's kind of like at an individualist, individual levels, having that sense of awareness. So what does the whole culture of empathy look like to you, right? If, I mean, if the whole culture has that awareness right. of, of, of empathy, right. what would that look like? Um, I believe that the whole culture is made up of, if you want the whole culture, it needs to be made up of whole individuals. Mm -hmm. And whole individuals are living in the whole culture. And the whole culture can create a whole community. And the whole community can and create a whole country. And in the end, this is like a microcosm, macrocosm kind of thing too, that we are all related. Because there's no healthy society if individuals are no individuals are not being whole and being healthy so there's that that connection in relationship so if uh, uh, empathy is kind of wholeness what is uh, the opposite of, of empathy like what would a metaphor be for that that would be uh, the separate like a par particle model uh, <laughs> being trapped uh -huh. in sort of narcissistic thinking that there's my way and my way is the only way and I'm disconnected from you and, um, and that would be the opposite of empathy and I don't think that's sustainable. Okay, so uh, we're, we're here we, and kind of maybe our society now kind of is a bit more kind of individualistic where we see ourselves as separate to a large extent. Um, and so how do we get to that, uh, kind of make that journey as a society or as an individual and a society towards that sense of wholeness, like what, which is kind of like the building that culture of, of empathy? Um, I think you mentioned in one of the interviews too, a self-empathy. And I, I really like that too, um, self-awareness. But um, okay, let me cl clarify that too. Uh, when people talk about being aware that, of themselves, they often talk about their current feelings that they're having or emotions. But I would say uh, it's much, empathy is not only about the feelings that you have when you're interacting with someone else. It can be in so many things, and I'll, I can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I think it's very important, vitally important, to know who we are first because I see too many people talk about empathy and they kind of um, uh, confuse empathy and sympathy mm -hmm. also and they feel like they're doing so much good to other people but they're not paying attention to their own growth they're not paying attention to their own uh, health and awareness so 
And someone told me one time that because I, I used to be one of those people. I wanted to make changes. I wanted to, you know, better the world. And, and then I realized that, okay, am I doing work on myself? If I ignore myself and if I try to change the world, maybe the outcome may, may not be as good as I hope to be. So it has to work in tandem. Um, so when people talk about empathy, first we need to look at ourselves and see who am I, am I doing, you know, what am I, uh, what am I about, what is my assignment, and I have to um, continuously improve myself and grow, and then at the same time I can talk about um, empathy. It, it's, so it's kind of a paying attention to myself and others at the same time. Yeah. It's kind of the. It's kind of like uh, I think that term I like is the humanity. It's like we see that see our common humanity, but it means seeing my humanity and your humanity at the same time, and right. somehow being able to hold uh, both of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes there's this notion of well, if I'm you know hel helping you, I have to. Uh, I have to discount myself. I have to. That's right. And then, and that was especially. I always think of this: the fifties, right? The, and the, where the women were supposed to sacrifice themselves exactly. for the family, you know, and your their needs were not supposed to really count. There's, and then it just causes all these kind of uh, emotional problems because it seems I think we all need to be heard and right. seen and felt. Right. Right. We, some of us still believe that it's a virtue, being selfless, you know, giving and giving selflessly is a virtue. Um, and I often use this um, example, too, that you cannot put an oxygen mask on someone else without your own first, right? So they often tell you in an emergency situation on an airplane, put your own oxygen mask first, and then you can assist others. So... Uh, we often just forget the fact that, you know, we need to take care of ourselves first. Because in the end, we are responsible um, for ourselves. And what uh, kind of approaches and strategies have you found kind of personally for that, uh, that self-empathy part? I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very um, hard on myself. And I can find myself being self-critical. So I try to give myself a pat on my back saying that, okay, maybe it may not be perfect, but I did the best I could. So, so I need to accept um, the way I am, um, how much I did, the best I could. And so um, I'm working on it. And uh -huh. I try in loving myself properly, not to be proud or not to be cocky, but loving myself properly, I think is the foundation of being able to extend empathy to other people. And you mentioned uh, appreciative inquiry, so it sounds like it's, it's uh, like not judging yourself, but kind of looking for the qualities, kind of being aware of those uh, certain qualities within yourself, uh, the positive qualities, I don't know if positive is the right word, but the, the ones that, the qualities that nurture connection and foster connection maybe. Right. And, you know, we, we often find ourselves looking at, you know, how can I improve myself? When we think about how can I become more successful, how can I be better, many of us think about, okay, what can I fix? Okay, here's a weakness. And I used to be guilty of telling my students, okay, you're doing this well, this, this, you know, you're doing this well too, but here is, a, you know, the area that you need to work on. But instead of that, um, it's much better to pay attention to uh, the strengths that one has and how we can make those strengths grow and how we can sustain the strengths but also learn to manage around weaknesses um, instead of paying so much attention and giving so much focus to to weaknesses do you have any uh, anecdotes about that like how that's actually played out in in your own life any stories? You're so good about um, the story with the dog, letting go of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my daughter, too, um, she brought home a report card one day, and my eyes immediately went to um, a grade that was not very good in math. And the first thing I said was, uh, what happened there? And she is the one that corrected me. But mom, look, I did well in this subject. I did well here, too. I did well. But you didn't say anything about those. So, and I um, 
learned from raising my own children that framing positively, framing around strengths, conversation goes much, much better. For example, when they used to come home, I used to say, how is school? And I used to say that every single day. And what they would say to me was fine. <laughs> fine. Yeah. You know. And then I went on thinking that that was a, a good answer. But so I reframed the question to, okay, tell me something that was really good today. You know, tell me something that went really well today. Something, tell me something that you are really happy about today. And then I start to get more and more and more stories. And the same thing with students. Instead of telling them not to do something or how you're going to fix this, if you ask them, okay, how did you succeed? How did you do so well in this? And then they have lots and lots of stories to tell. So, so many good examples of how uh, humans are like plants. They turn towards the sun. So they do not seem to learn very much about being told how terrible they are. Yeah. But <laughs> it's funny that our society is so based on criticism, though. It keeps using exactly. it so much in judgment and criticism. And mm -hmm. I wonder what that's all about. Well, that, I, I really think that that needs to change because... Um, Apparently, in psychology, over 90% of all journal articles are written about depression or all the negative uh, human conditions. So if it really is true that um, you know, what we pay attention to happens more, then what are we doing? <laughs> We're making uh -huh. us more sick. Yeah. You know? So um, it, it is true neuroscientifically, too. They have proven that repeated thoughts that we have in our brains, um, we're leaving uh, neural signatures. They're like leaving kind of marks on our brain so that next time you experience the same thing, it takes much shorter time to feel the negative feelings that you have. So, and that's, that's why it really is scientifically true that we create our own reality. So if we keep thinking, you know, repeatedly negative thoughts like, oh, I, I won't do well on exams or I don't do this well, then sure enough, you know, that tends to happen. Yeah, I can imagine it's kind of like from generation to generation, if you're growing up and there's a lot of criticism kind of at a young age, it's those critical pathways are being created right. in the brain. <laughs> So it's just easy to kind of keep in that um, in that groove. That's right. And then it kind of just goes on, maybe generation after generation, and and it's like, how do you? It's it's a little bit more difficult to change those patterns and habits. Right. right. Yeah. So I guess it's like, how do we? Uh, and then it sounds like what you're saying is, if with appreciative inquiry, and and I don't know if that's how you're doing it in in the business. Uh, and field is kind of looking at the positive and start creating those um, uh, pathways to uh, that uh, kind of foster empathy and connection. Um, well, empathy is not being talked about that much just yet, but uh, business world is uh, definitely shifting from the deficit model, looking at what we did not do well to what we did well and how we can do more of what we did well. Mm -hmm. So definitely it's shifting to the strength-based model. And I think the next step is to be able to um, really see ourselves as humans with feelings and spirits and all these other irrational parts included in us instead of seeing as a brain on a stick or, or you know, cogs in a machine or um, so that is kind of happening too yeah so are you saying that there in business there's a move towards the positive but it's not quite yet uh towards building a culture of empathy not quite uh -huh. not quite i think that that uh sense of competition and you know you have to go out there and win and there's limited uh limited amount of success and resources is still very deeply deeply rooted so um that Yes, sense of competition is very strong, profit-driven. Mm. Well, that's what I'm looking at, is really to take the, uh, the value of empathy and kind of hold it up and see it as a vision of something, an intention to move towards that, and that sense mm -hmm. of uh, wholeness, right? It, it's really that, that yes. sense of wholeness and seeing the whole not being like uh, 
you know, seeing ourselves cut off. But uh, and a lot of people are really critical about, you know, business and corporations. And and I, I feel like we need to transform businesses and corporations. Yes. yes. And make, because people spend so much of their time there that we need to have cultures of empathy uh, within right. within uh, the corporate and business structures. Right. I often tell people the reason why I stay in business, even though I do not consider myself a real hardcore business person, I teach management, so I teach the human aspects of uh, managing an organization. Um, but I really like to stay in business because I think a, a bus if a business can transform itself, I think the positive impact on the society is going to be tremendous. So a business can be a really good vehicle for uh, social change. Yeah, there's all these there's, uh, social entrepreneur type organizations. Yes. Uh, right. Do you see that kind of as a model? or? I think so. I think so. Uh, businesses can do well by doing good. And more and more so that people, consumers are becoming smart too, so that they may not vote with their dollars if the company is not doing uh, good things or if they're destroying the environment or if they're uh, exploiting their employees. Uh, we're starting to find out more and more about what they do inside their companies and how they practice their businesses. So so within, uh, within your um, uh, teaching there at the university, I mean, you're working on empathy. What, what are, how, how are you kind of approaching that? Is that like, do you have like a curriculum or do you have discussions or classes? Uh, how are you kind of exploring um, empathy there? I, I'm one of the teachers who bring in uh, a lot of um, more interdisciplinary ap approach to teaching. So I often bring in uh, poetry or video clips or stories and things like that. For example, I don't know if you have heard this story called Cracked Pot. No. It's an Indian story. Who uh, the story about a servant who worked for his master, and one of the tasks that he had to do every day was to walk down the path to fetch some water, and he had two pots, and he would walk up the path balancing the two pots on a like a bar, and one of the pots was cracked and old, so half of the water leaked out by the time he walked up the hill, and the the old and cracked pot spoke to him and said that I'm, I feel really badly for you because I'm old and cracked and, and I, can, I can only get you half the pot. And he said that, but have you noticed something? Only on your side of the path. So what had happened was the water was leaking out, so the servant had planted some flower seeds. So only on his side of the path uh, the flowers were growing. So I use stories like that mm -hmm. and then have my students uh, figure out, um, okay, what kind of manager or leader is this servant? Can see someone's, this pot seemingly weakness, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's cracked mm -hmm. and, and broken. But this servant knew how to turn it around and make, turn that into a strength. So because he was uh, cracked and old and broken, he made the, all these flowers grow because he was he was watering, you know, all these seeds all this time. So, yeah, how, so I use uh, stories and video clips and like in that story, how does uh, empathy play a role? It's like it. How would you kind of connect that story to empathy? Um, being able to look at the person really deeply into that person and see what the person has to offer. So it's easy to dismiss that pot. Okay, it's mm -hmm. broken and old, so I just need to throw it away and get a new pot. Uh, so you can kind of, you know, replace that with uh, dealing with human resources, right? You can do this, so I'm just going to let you go and hire a new person. But this person can really see deeply into this, this person's, this pot's real strength. Real, even though he was broken, he had a strength that was not easily seen on the surface, but he could use empathy to really look into that pot to see um, how, so as a leader or manager, he would be able to see, okay, this person it may not be good at doing this, but let's see, there's another hidden strength there I might be able to find. Mm -hmm. so without empathy, I don't think it's possible to see deeply into a person to see 
um, the person's real strength or capability. And how is that uh, capability developed? Like what kind of, uh, do you have, like that's kind of the, the capability there and the importance of having the capability, how maybe just uh, being aware that it's important that makes people mm -hmm. want to learn it. Right. Um, is there any other kind of ways of kind of uh, learning that uh, capability or? Um, I, th I think one would have to, uh, relating to empathy, to be able to see the person as, um, see each person as a developmental, you know, see the developmental stages. So, and someone told me early on when I became a professor uh, in management that when you look at your employees, you have to see them sitting in different chairs. They all outgrow their chairs. And as a leader or manager's job to see, okay, Edwin, you have been sitting in that chair for a long time. Is that chair getting a little too small for you? Would you like to sit in a little bigger chair? Mm -hmm. Would you like to sit in a little different chair so you can learn about different lessons and different skills and different, you know, so, uh, and that's empathy too, to be able to see how each person is developing and to be able to, to um, know that he or she is ready for the next phase of skill development or or evolving as a person or so i really think that human development is really closely tied with a spiritual um, growth too and um i i think people who have a supervisor who can see how for example you have been you have learned so much in this position and i can see that maybe you're ready to be able to do this kind of thing. Oh, so uh -huh. yeah. So you're really kind of like a like a, a facilitator, a guide towards the as a manager to uh, nurture the growth. Uh, right. And to nurture the growth, you really have to be able to perceive where the person is, what it is, where they are, kind of an emotional right. level. Right. Right. And even at the deeper level too. And uh, a good leader may encourage each employee to think about what their purpose might be, and what their what their story is, and what their uh, assignment might be. Assignment meaning from a spiritual sense. For example, um, I knew that I was born to teach, and but what I what I teach, I may still change my mind. But but you know things like that. We have a good hunch about what we are here to do. And I think everyone should be encouraged to really explore um, who we are and what we're about and what vehicle we can do our purpose in. Well, is that what your uh, book is about? It's, it's like you're doing a book with uh, multiple authors. Uh, so I guess kind of uh, you're writing some yourself and then editing. So what's the overall framework uh, of, of the book, um, Organizing Through Empathy? What's kind of Okay. It, this is still work in progress, so we just really don't know, you know, which chapters we're going to include and how it's going to turn out. But uh, we have a section at, of um, learning empathy at the individual level and then at the organizational level. And we're considering maybe putting kind of a section on leadership, how leaders learn um, empathy. So, and the piece that I would like to write about is... Um, uh, actually, I have asked Peter Senge, I don't know if you know Peter yeah. Senge, who has written a book called The Fifth Discipline, to co-author a chapter with me on, um, um, we can call it empathy and systems thinking, or empathy and wholeness, which means empathy is not just a feeling. Often, empathy is being talked about between, you know, two people, how they interact with each other, and how they can see, feel other people's feelings. But I, I would say that empathy has to be almost like in a DNA, in every cell. So it's not just when you interact with other people in your product. How do you show empathy in the product that you manufacture? Because I have seen a product that is just so well made that I can see that people thought about the user when they were making it. It just made so gently and so nice to use for you know, the people who, who use it. And um, there's a, a brewery in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, in their box, they put a message on the box, in the, in the case of beer. It says, 
uh, inside this box is a product of love. <laughs> uh huh. So, so empathy can come in so many different forms. It's not just when you interact with other people. If you have empathy, you cannot make a product that's half-hearted that could possibly hurt someone. And you can really take it to a, the highest level of empathy and make a product that is so wonderfully made. And then if you have empathy, you may not buy Uh, material from suppliers who exploit their workers or who may have um, damaged the environment or who may have abused um, not just people but animals. So, you know, I, I often talk about factory farming. There's no empathy there. There's no empathy for people, for animals, for the environment, nothing. So, um, So those are the kinds of things I teach. Oh, wow. So it's really that when we build something it's kind of, and we build it with empathy, we're thinking of how this is going to affect the user uh, yes. of it. It's like we have their experience in, our, in us. Our, we're mm -hmm. empathizing with it. And so we want to build it uh, for their, that, so that it kind of fits their needs and, and makes their, their well uh, makes right. their well-being for their maximum right. well-being and that's right. kind of the product going out as well as all the suppliers all the components that kind of come right. into the it, product is we right. have empathy for, for and wholeness uh, with with them and right so it's not just in the product it's in the the people who make it are you really caring for the people who are producing it if you do not take care of the people who produce the product that you really want to pr produce it won't be there so empathy has to be part of the dna meaning that it, in everything you do you think about the best for the people best for the world best for everybody involved so and also Uh, within an organization, if you behave with empathy, you do not just only look at your part and when something doesn't happen, you do not react. I see too much reacting from a lot of people because they only pay attention to their immediate part or immediate department. And if they did not get something, they may react and lash out and say, how come I didn't get this on time or how come? But If you really practice empathy, and if you could, if you're able to see the wholeness, the whole system, you can have a little leeway in understanding that maybe something got hung up there, maybe something happened here, and so you can stand back to see the whole picture of the whole system, and just be able to see the relationships and patterns. But we tend to live in silos, so. We only know what's within the silo, and when something doesn't happen, we only know how to react and blame other people and, and complain and lash out. Yeah, so it's kind of like you look at the product that you're going to create, you look at where it came from, and you look at the uh, relationship that while you're making the product with all the people in the, the overall mm -hmm. system. So it's a very kind of, it's really, a, it's kind of like your consciousness is going out So yes. This whole it's like a it's not the, a focused consciousness, but a consciousness to the to the right. whole. Right. And I also try to um, teach about congruency too. I tell my students, okay, you may graduate and become a business leader, but you will also be a consumer. You will also be um, a community person. So you're going to be all kinds of stakeholders at the same time. So there's no such thing as you can do this because you're a business person. And if you do something bad, you are doing that to yourself because you're also a community person who may be drinking the, the water. You know, we want to drink clean water, right? So, um, so I try to teach them about um, microcosm, macrocosm. Um, they cannot just be one business person and not be the consumer or the parent or the community person. We're all one person yeah so this uh this empathy kind of extends to all kind of walks all aspects of life so yes not just in the yes. business when you're going home it's relating to your family it's relating to your your kind of your way of relating to society so it's almost like a a uh it's like a, it's a whole way of being 
Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that's why I'd like to, to think of it as um, empathy being in my own DNA, in every cell, so that it's impossible for me to do anything that would possibly um, knowingly harm that would harm someone or harm something. So, um, and in business, we often hear about um, it's a game. Business is a game. Yeah. So, uh, someone may say that I would never do this to my family, but it's business. It's competition. We have to do it. And, and I tell my students, no, there's no such thing. You have to be congruent. If you would not do that to your family, to your friend, you would not do that as a business person either because you are the same person. Yeah, so this, it, this is all about empathy. <laughs> it is. It's really, you're, what you're really describing is a culture of empathy. It's what I just put the word on is culture of empathy. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. and I would even take it a step farther with the culture of empathy in the sense that it's not just kind of holding that awareness, but saying, actively saying we need to promote that awareness within society too. In the you know what I'm saying? It's like it has its yes. manifestation. It's like saying, okay, the political system, you know, we need to promote that. We need to, yes. and it, I guess it's kind of like an empathic activism. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. yes. And, um, it, and I would say that my mother taught me, I came this way too, but I saw my mother living like that in, it's funny, I grew up in Japan. And people may not always talk about things as we would do here, but I saw my mother quietly do so many things. Um, we, ha we, my mother was putting together garbage to put out, and we had those bamboo skewers. I can't remember what we ate, but but she was breaking those little bamboo skewers into smaller pieces to put in the garbage bag, and. And she scolded me when I threw out one sharp, you know, whole bamboo skewer. And she said that, don't do that. The garbage person who picks it up may hurt himself. Mm. And we did not know this person. So my mother would extend empathy to someone that she did not even know. And she was the kind of person, if there's a rock in the middle of the path, she would take a few seconds to remove it. She would always think about in very many quiet ways. Uh, so that was, that's just the way of being. Mm -hmm. So empathy can be something that you do, but, but something, something that you, you are, part of your DNA, part of your breathing, part of your being. And my mother lived that way. So she became like, a, your mother became like a model for you. It's like we were talking about judgment. If you grow up, in a family environment of judgment, those pathways are kind of getting right. built. And you grew up in an environment where your mother had empathy and it's like started creating those empathic mm -hmm. uh, pathways. Right. right. And that's the kind of thing that I would really would like to bring to the Western world too, because I grew up in Japan. And, you know, Japan is changing too, but I learned so many beautiful things as I was growing up there. Um, another good example, um, it was a stormy day, and we were wondering if there was school that day. And I said uh, to my mother, I'm going to call school and find out if there's school today. And my mother was able to put herself in the shoes of the, the person at school. And she said, no, because if you put yourself in that person's position, he or she may be getting many, many calls. And she said, that's one person versus hundreds of people or thousands of students may be calling at the same time. So she said that it's not, it's not good to call. You can find out on your own. You can go to school or you can, you know, call a friend or so. She was very empathetic about almost everything she did. She was immediately able to put herself in the shoes of the other person answering all the calls. So she said, no, don't, don't do that. You know, th th those are small things. Oh, yeah, but... <laughs> they're big. They're, they're small, but in a sense, they're they're kind of like a whole essence way of being. You know, so mm -hmm. it's huge in other ways. And she used to loan some money to some of the people that she knew, and, and she had her own little business, too. And she didn't get some of the money back sometimes. So I said, oh, I, what are you going to do? My mother said that when I loaned that money, I considered that as I gave it to her. 
So she never even expected, you know. So I don't know how that relates to empathy, but the way she lived was uh, was very beautiful. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a certain beauty to the quality of empathy mm-hmm. to it that it has it's, a. It's a little bit different from the the empathy uh, topics that we we may talk about in the Western world. Um, yeah, it's it's, and then there's an interesting business example too. I didn't actually work with this business, but I saw this on the Japanese TV channel. It's a moving company in Japan. When they move things, they covered all the walls so that there won't even be one scratch by moving furniture, you know, out of the house. And they would take off their shoes. Even when they're moving heavy pieces of furniture, all the movers would take off their shoes every time they enter the house. And also they um, would bring a big truck into a narrow street in Japan and they would give little gifts to, gifts to all the houses on that same street because they'll be inconveniencing them, you know. So and lot, lots of um, small examples, but beautiful examples of practicing empathy as a business and as a person. Yeah, it's like it's almost like it's uh, the, the empathy is like a gateway to caring and beauty and love in, in, mm-hmm. in that. And many things can be done so naturally, so naturally, and something that we don't even talk about. So if it's in your DNA, uh, you would naturally be doing a lot of things. If someone is coming, you hold the door for a few seconds, or if someone needs to go by you, you move away, or, you know, People who know about empathy do not just uh, lecture about it, but they live in so many subtle, uh, different ways. Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, it's like where do you what what uh, how do you kind of promote that uh, that way of being, you know, within society and and uh, like your mother, like I don't know, it's like your mother. She kind of showed you by example. But she, yes. but she wasn't uh, out there advocating, saying, well, we've got to change the society to make this a way of being, you know. That's a little right. bit kind of the angle I'm coming from, is we need to have it, but we also need to, uh, you know, kind of actively, uh, I guess, address maybe the fears, right? There's mm-hmm. People are so afraid in society, and there's so much judgment, and they're kind of closing off, and it's like, it's like, uh, well, if I don't just take care of myself and, you know, maximize my own, you know, profit or well-being or, you know, that I'm going to get crushed because other right. people don't care about me, right? Other people aren't <laughs> going to be, you know, taking their shoes off when they come into my house. They're going to come into my house with muddy shoes. So I better, you know, take care of myself. Right. Yeah, I, I think that we have to kind of go about it in two different ways. Uh, so I consider myself an activist in many ways. I like to go out there and talk about things and write about things that I care about. And at the same time, I need to be peaceful within myself. I need to keep modeling, even though it seems cumbersome sometimes. But uh, one of the things my students tell me, whether they like my teaching style or not, they, they say to me, that I'm the same person wherever I am. And they, they one, you know, some students told me that they actually respect that because they are so used to seeing people who say certain things in public. You know, some teachers may say wonderful things in the classroom, but when they, when the students go to see him or her in their office, they may be a different person. But um, so, in the classroom, I talk about many of the things that I care about. Sometimes I call it, okay, this is Keiko's soapbox time. Hmm. So <laughs> I, I talk about the things that I heard on the radio, it's things that make me mad. or so, uh, so they see me as one congruent person. So role modeling, even though it seems kind of uh, whimsical, it does, it does work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that little actions... We underestimate it, but I think by doing little actions, they may create ripple effects, and I think we can make bigger changes than than we might think. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. So, uh, what what other kind of aspects of this do you think are important to talk about the around empathy? What other kind of parts of it do you think is really important? Okay, um, I recently did a workshop on uh, compassion. 
and I specifically talked about how we have so many disconnects. It's easy to talk about empathy when we talk about friends and relatives and family members. And it's just, it's easy to care. It's easy to extend empathy to the people that we know. But for example, if we talk about um, people in the Arab world, some people still think that they're, you know, the enemies after 9-11. So do we extend the same level of empathy? Even though, you know, even when people look at different pictures, different faces, the level of empathy that they feel towards certain people might be different. And um, they may care, they may love their dogs. You know, why, why can we eat pigs and cows? So we seem to, to draw a line somewhere. Mm. So I would really like to challenge us to think about the ethics of those, um, the boundaries. Why we do that? Is it ethical to, to draw that boundary? Yeah, so it's kind of this notion of, of empathy and kind of where our boundary for empathy is and and why are those boundaries there and how can we yes. extend them or actually just let them down. And Right. So one time I asked my students, if you saw someone uh, beating up a dog, you know, torturing a dog, what would you do? They all said that they would do something. They would do something. One student even said, oh, I would go and beat up this guy. <laughs> And I said, what if the, the animal were a pig? But they immediately said that, well, but it's a pig. It's supposed to, to die anyway. And I said, really? Is it really? So, so empathy and also critical thinking and being able to be honest with ourselves, why we do what we do and why we draw those boundaries and can we explain those boundaries? And, and those are all issues because... I rarely hear about empathy towards extended towards farm animals, for example. But if they learn that they, you know, that they have the same intelligence levels as, as dogs that we love, you know, mm -hmm. and they have the same emotions and more and more evidence that they are more like us than they're not. Mm. Yeah, well, you you brought up uh, compassion. Um, and uh, in terms of the definition of compassion, I've seen, uh, I see kind of in my definition, and there's a lot of different definitions of, of, of empathy out there. But for me, uh, compassion is, is kind of empathy applied to suffering. So it's a little bit like you, you grow, when you grew up, you were kind of like very focused on that aspect Mm -hmm. of of uh, the suffering just being very aware of the suffering of others so that would be a bit in the in the uh, definition wise maybe the compassion uh, part of empathy um, that's probably true uh, compassion uh, to me sounds more like acting to do something about it mm -hmm. um, empathy may be able to you may be able to feel what other people are feeling or to sense what other people are going through um, um, in Japanese, empathy is often translated as uh, crying together. Crying does not mean uh, sadly crying, but but together, crying mm -hmm. together kind of thing. So, uh, But compassion to me sounds more like doing something about it, maybe mm -hmm. followed by empathy. You have empathy and then you you do something about that. You act on it. Well, I've, I've been interviewing you know, a lot of people and asking about the definitions and it interviewed uh, Dan Batson as well. You know, he's been studying empathy for like 30 years and he did a, a paper on a chapter in a book actually on how, emp how the word empathy is used. And, and he's just showing how different communities are kind of using the word differently. And so I've been trying to kind of have the kind of this overview of finding all the different, you know, uh, definitions and the way the word is used including you know the traditions from Carl Rogers and mm -hmm. and you know the arts and whatnot and the kind of the definition that I've put together is that empathy is like a four part uh, mm -hmm. four parts to it that the first part is and they don't necessarily are not necessarily layered but they're kind of like around the wheel you know right in that they kind of interact and the first part is self empathy which we started mm -hmm. talking about which is Kind of that mindfulness, sensory awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves, right. Right. and uh, then the second part is as we have that, you know, if we're very fearful and kind of shutting ourselves down, 
we can't take in others and others' experiences. So as we have that mindfulness, that calmness, that openness, we kind of open, and then yeah. I'm open through mirror neurons to kind of experience. I mm -hmm. see you shaking your head, and I can kind of feel that you know that right. head shaking through mirror neurons. Right. And I call that mirrored empathy, mm -hmm. and that's you know the scientists call it the uh, uh, emotional or affective. Uh, empathy, and mm -hmm. then the third part is the uh, uh, cognitive or perspective taking, which I mm -hmm. like to call imaginative empathy. It's like as we have self, a sense of self awareness, mm -hmm. I can start getting a sense of the back. You know, I know that we tried to arrange this uh, this discussion. We had some audio problems. Maybe <laughs> you're maybe you're feeling a little frazzled. You had to run around. You know, try to get things arranged or whatever. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have a sense of the whole picture. A, right. a view as a separate being, mm -hmm. and then the third, the fourth part is empathic action. Mm -hmm. That it's kind, of, it's really that as we kind of connect, I know and hold, hold your uh, humanity and my humanity kind of at the same time. Right. That how do we interact with each other with that awareness? And so it's like wanting to, you know, I want to double. I want your well-being. Your your uh, your joy, kind of like double your joy, double your creativity, mm -hmm. as well as uh, you know, uh, uh, help with uh, uh, bringing down your suffering, your pain and mm -hmm. suffering, because it's mm -hmm. what I would do for myself with my own right. experience. Right. So, right. Uh, those are the the kind of the four parts of of empathy, and for me, the um, that process applied to someone's suffering is what I see as compassion. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. like, it's the exact same process, you know, kind of this, if I'm suffering, you know, it's like self-compassion, you know, I'm kind of seeing the, you know, mm -hmm. the suffering in someone else, I understand the suffering, and I want mm -hmm. to take action to, mm -hmm. so we could actually have different words, like if I see you're in fear, we can have a separate word for empathy applied to fear, empathy applied to alienation, Right. So okay. That's a little bit of the you know how where my thinking and my mm -hmm. picture, my mm -hmm. model is right now. So I'm wondering how that kind of resonates mm -hmm. with your understanding. That's very interesting. Yes, um, I think compassion is rarely used for positive things, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's used for suffering, being able to um, understand one's suffering. Um, and back to um, uh, at the beginning, I said that I have been kind of conditioned early on to kind of feel and hear people's suffering and animal suffering and so forth. But um, from the positive side, being able to empathize with all the positive things like other people's joy and strengths and so forth, that would be, I think, um, the next step. I, I really think that there's a lot of hope in that because um, that may be the only way we may be able to resolve and solve all the problems that we have globally. And we need to be able to align our strengths. We need to be mm. able to, That's you know, the appreciative inquiry you're talking about. Right, it's like right. we need to appreciate the positive qualities that empathy brings and kind of right. focus on that, right. on that positive. And that's uh -huh. exactly no, exactly ahead. what you're doing mm -hmm. instead of you know each person learning about empathy you know that's good too you learn about empathy and and other people have written books and and i read those books and that's that's good but what you're doing is phenomenal because you are aligning bringing people like uh all the people who are interested in empathy together mm -hmm. so it's go it's going to be much bigger than the sum of us put together so when you interact and I might see someone else's interview and I become interested in, oh, I really like to meet her. I really mm -hmm, like to meet mm -hmm. her. Maybe what I offer, what he offers, there may be something there. We may be onto something. So that way, uh, my strength and someone else's strengths can come together and become much, much bigger. And that's what you're doing. Yeah, that's the, it's, I, when I when I first started asking people how do we build a culture of empathy, somebody said create a dialogue about it. Just yes. get people talking about it, and mm -hmm. so this is kind of like the first step is to just find who are the people that are already in, interested and have some insights and really right. thinking about this, and let's start talking with them. Start the 
and then make that available and then get them together. You know, the next <laughs> phase is kind of having these panel or empathy circles. That would be great. So yes. I would yes. love to, you know, yes. have that be our next uh, next step so that we can start networking with others. And then once we've kind of have that going, then we reach out to the communities who aren't quite on board yet, you know, with the empathy. Okay. Yes. But we have kind of like a foundation and a momentum to engage, you know, with those communities. Right. And I'm glad that um, I appreciate you're doing this because I'm often not very good at just reaching out to people and connecting with people. I tend to kind of do my own thing in my office, although I advocate, you know, connectedness, interconnectedness. But I, I don't know, maybe because of my Japanese background, um, you know, when you invited me, I said, wow, this is a great idea. And I love to share what I know, but, but I'm not always the initiator. Mm -hmm. So... So um, I'm glad that somebody like you um, is, you know, connecting all of us mm, together. Thanks. Well, it's kind of from my seeking background. I was a when I when I graduated from high school here in Sacramento. You know, I in my teens graduated from high school. And I said I want to learn by doing. It was like, you know, mm. that Sid Hartha. You know, let's travel around the world and kind of connect yes. and learn by mm -hmm. doing. So mm -hmm. this is like a new. This is like an extension of that. I'm right. kind of like seeking, right. instead of going to the mountaintop to talk to the guru, I just do it through Skype for now. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And I think that's, uh, uh, I, I think we need to be wise to um, use the technology wisely in for the, the betterment of humanity, like you are doing. And, and I think there's a lot of hope in... Um, you know, all the connecting mechanisms like Facebook, and, and there may be some negative things too, but but it's just so easy to connect with someone who may be living in another country, you know, so. Yeah, so it's kind of like that product you're talking about. We need to use the technologies and, and embed the uh, technology with the empathy so that the technology yes. is fostering kind of this culture of empathy by its very right. nature and its very being. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I, I always say that, you know, innovation or uh, entrepreneurship are good things, but without empathy, without the ethics, without uh, wholeness, without all these things, we could be creating a monster. You know, we could easily be using it for uh, the wrong purposes. So, um, yeah, if we're, if, we're, if we're doing it out of greed, fear and selfishness. <laughs> We're going to create the product that has kind of those qualities embedded in right. it. If we create those products out of uh, empathy and beauty and care, mm -hmm. that it's uh, they're going to it's they're going to embed that quality. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it carries that energy too. If someone were to to create a product with a lot of empathy and being um, kind to the user in mind, I'm sure that the user can feel that empathy feel that kindness as energy because energy is in 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 everything so um well this is great um we've gone for about an hour so uh, it sounds like we have a plan <laughs> for doing uh, maybe some panel discussions uh around this and we can uh maybe arrange that through email and kind of set up sure. something. it's just sure. so delightful yes. you know talking to and to you and you oh know, just, i appreciate you too so Okay, then uh, then I'll, I'll be uh, contacting you by email unless you have any okay. final thoughts or anything. Okay, okay. well, please let me know. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to be shy sometimes, but please let me know if I could help in any way. Okay. Uh, I really, really deeply care about the, the um, well-being of humanity. And I, I do believe, even though we hear some ugly things, I do believe that... Uh, we're headed in the right direction in general. So um, that's the hopeful side of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Keiko, it was wonderful talking to you. Okay, we'll talk to you so soon. Okay, okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.